Gaude amus omnes in domino. I am going the way of the fathers, for I see myself being summoned by the Lord. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host for this series, Mike Aquilina. Today we move on from our discussion of the Greek apologists of the second century, and we take up the great pioneer of anti-heretical literature, Irenaeus of Lyon. Irenaeus was born around 130 and died around 202. He's best known as the author of a massive work in five books. It's a sprawling, meandering argument whose title speaks its purpose plainly, against heresies. Now, heresy is a problem as old as religion itself. In earlier episodes, we heard how Ignatius of Antioch was troubled on one side by docetists who denied the true humanity of Jesus, and on the other side by Judaizers who wanted to restore the dietary and ritual laws of Moses. But in the second century, the problem became rather acute because of a movement known as Gnosticism. Gnosticism is hard to categorize. It wasn't a sect. It wasn't exclusively Christian. And it wasn't organized in any way or bound by any creed. It was an intellectual fad, really. An alternate way of interpreting and spinning traditional ideas so that they often came to mean their opposite. Some Gnostic teachers claimed the heritage of Judaism, for example, but they subverted the major traditions and tenets of the Jews. Other Gnostic teachers gave their twisted spin to the old Greek and Roman myths. But it seems that most of the historical figures associated with Gnosticism chose to identify themselves as Christian. Gnostic schools and sects were many, and polymorphous, but they held certain characteristics in common. They emphasized knowledge rather than faith. The word Gnostic, in fact, comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. Gnostic teachers promised to deliver secret doctrines, certain knowledge that would guarantee a successful afterlife and true wisdom in this life. Gnostic Christians believed that the true doctrine of Jesus was not to be found in the words of the Gospels or in the church but rather in secrets that had been passed down in a hidden way from one teacher to another. The secrets were not intended to reach many people, but only a spiritual elite. They also believed that the material world was an evil fabrication of a lesser god. Thus, they rejected the Old Testament with its stories of creation and its worship of the Creator. In their telling, the Creator was actually a rebellious spirit who trapped good spirits in human bodies. The flesh, then, was a prison and nothing more. Jesus, according to the Gnostics, was a spirit who came from much higher realms. He chose exile in order to save his fellow exiled spirits from their fleshly bondage to the wicked creator. Most Gnostic teachers didn't reject the Gospels outright but they encouraged extreme allegorical interpretations, and they tended to read a lot between the lines. So they could proclaim Judas as a hero, for example, and condemn the other apostles as flunkies. They were, moreover, prone to producing imaginative, new gospels and top-secret, expanded versions of the old gospels. These creative writing exercises proliferated in the second century. There is, however, no evidence that the Gnostics evangelized their pagan neighbors. They lived instead like parasites on the Catholic Church. They flattered wealthy Christians, telling them that they were spiritually superior to others. They flattered intellectuals and pseudo-intellectuals by calling them away from the ignorant rabble of typical parishioners. And people in the ancient world were as vulnerable to flattery as people today. You can see how Gnosticism could create problems in a community. It divides people along fault lines of class and education. It destroys all common language and culture and renders it unreal. 
It deconstructs and twists the community's principles until they mean the opposite of their literal sense. It empowers people to sneer at their neighbors, and all the while, they can feel good about their own superiority. Irenaeus saw that Gnosticism was corroding the faith of individuals and even churches. He was concerned also because he knew some of the men who had set themselves up as Gnostic teachers. One man in particular he had known since his childhood. Gnosticism seemed to be the great temptation of the most gifted and educated clergy of his time. Irenaeus was steeled against it because he himself had received extraordinary Christian formation. We know him as Irenaeus of Lyon, but he actually grew up a far stretch from Gaul, or France as it's known today. He grew up in Smyrna, one of the major coastal cities in Asia Minor, or Turkey as it's known today. As a young man, Irenaeus learned the faith from Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna. Polycarp, in turn, learned the faith from St. John the Evangelist. And St. John, in turn, learned the faith from Jesus Christ. It's hard to imagine a Christian pedigree more purebred than the short lineage of Irenaeus. He spent his youth in the company of his master, Polycarp. Later in life, writing to a childhood companion, he recalled those days. I listened eagerly, even then, to these things said by Polycarp, and made notes of them, not on paper, but in my heart. And ever by the grace of God do I truly ruminate on them. St. Irenaeus felt a grave responsibility to carry forward Polycarp's doctrine. At some point, he moved from Smyrna to Lyon, then called Lugdunum, and there he was active in the life of the church, which was then undergoing a renewed persecution under the emperor Marcus Aurelius. Respected for his intelligence and also for his connection to Polycarp, St. Irenaeus was consulted by popes on important questions of the day. In the mid-2nd century, the church was suffering as much from division as from persecution. Christians in the East differed from those in the West about the proper day to celebrate the Lord's resurrection. The argument grew so intense that there was danger of excommunication and schism. Irenaeus counseled moderation and calm, thus averting a crisis. But Irenaeus saw Gnosticism as the greatest threat to Christian faith. He heard Jesus' dire warning, and he took it to heart. Jesus told his disciples, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Far more than he feared Roman persecutors, Irenaeus feared the damage that deceptive teachers could do. And Gnosticism was hard to fight. Every teacher had his own secrets to reveal, and doctrine differed wildly from school to school and sect to sect. The heresy was constantly metastasizing because its revelations came to individual teachers through private knowledge. For a man preparing a response, it was a constantly moving target. So Irenaeus went after the Gnostic teachers one at a time. He considered them singly and addressed their doctrines thoroughly and with clarity, though in a rambling way. He didn't go by hearsay. It's evident that he took the time to read each Gnostic teacher's writings and understand them as best he could. For that, he deserves a Medal of Valor or maybe a purple heart, because a lot of it is just murk and obfuscation, the hocus-pocus of magic spells interspersed with the abstractions of Plato's philosophy. The trick, it seems, was to reveal just enough to make your Gnostic disciples feel superior to the rabble, and yet still keep them mystified enough so they remained dependent on their teacher. Irenaeus labored through his refutation, point by point, self-appointed sage by self-appointed sage, and for the most part he kept his cool, although at one spot, while wading through the swamp of Gnostic terminology, he loses his patience altogether and gives up on the argument altogether. Instead, he simply writes a parody of the Gnostic cosmology, replacing the high-sounding names of the archons and emanations with the names of fruits, the divine cucumber, and the divine pumpkin, and the divine melon, and so on. For the most part, though, he argued. He argued steadily, if not quite methodically. Against the fanciful theories of the Gnostics, he contrasted the doctrine of the Catholic Church. 
The Catholic doctrine was trustworthy, he said, because it was public, simple, open to everyone, and could be traced directly to Jesus by a very short lineage. Irenaeus recognized that lineage in the bishops, who could legitimately claim to be successors of the apostles. His exemplary case was the line of bishops in Rome, the popes, whose names he could and did list off in their entirety. It would be very tedious, he said, to reckon up the lines of succession in all the churches. So he homed in on the Roman church because it was, he said, the very great, the very ancient and universally known church founded and organized by the two most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul. It's a matter of necessity, he added, that every church should agree with this church on account of its preeminent authority. And that's a quote. Then he listed off the Roman bishops one by one, from Peter to Linus to Anacletus to Clement, until he got to his own day when Eleutherius reigned, in the twelfth place from the apostles, holding the inheritance, he said, of the episcopate. Catholics have, ever since, seen this passage as the classic exposition of Roman primacy and the authority of the papacy. It makes explicit the claims that are implicit in earlier works by Clement of Rome and Ignatius of Antioch. Since the time of the Protestant Reformation, this passage has been translated and retranslated, parsed and analyzed, upheld and explained away by countless controversialists. It's an essential element of any discussion of papal and episcopal authority. But it's just a tiny passage in a grand, multi-volume work of brilliant, if digressive, theological reflection. Please don't be fooled by Irenaeus's title. Against Heresies is more than a negative critique. It's also a sustained, positive statement of the apostolic tradition, which Irenaeus called the rule of faith. In the course of his work, he witnesses to both the humanity and divinity of Jesus. He speaks of the Trinity and the Incarnation. He affirms the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. He demonstrates, moreover, that these teachings are consistent with the Scriptures and have been constant since the time of the Apostles. He also presents a developed Marian doctrine. He speaks of her as undoing the knot of Eve's disobedience. Thus, he lays the foundation for the modern devotion to the Blessed Virgin as undoer of knots. Irenaeus wrote many other works besides Against Heresies, but only one other has survived, a little book called The Proof of the Apostolic Preaching. It's a far more concise exposition of the faith. Pope Benedict XVI in 2007 referred to it as the oldest catechism of Christian doctrine. Irenaeus won renown in his own lifetime and has been quoted as an authority in every generation afterward. He was bishop in a challenging time and led his local church through the most severe trials, persecution from without and heresy from within, battling both fronts simultaneously and successfully. Gnosticism reappears in new forms and with new names in every generation, but among Christians, it's never been able to recover the momentum it had in the first half of the second century. Since then, the forceful arguments of Irenaeus have been waiting at every turn. We don't know much more about the later life of our hero apart from the writings that have survived. On the church's calendar, he is remembered as a martyr, though we have no ancient account of his martyrdom. Recently, the bishops of the United States and France have petitioned the Pope to name Irenaeus as a doctor of the Church, one of the Church's most revered teachers in all of history. Well, we'd like to bring the message of Irenaeus and the message of all the Fathers to more and more people in our own time. So please consider making a donation to keep these podcasts going. Our sponsor, CatholicCulture.org, is run by Trinity Communications, a nonprofit organization, so donations are tax-deductible in the United States. Donations can be made by credit card, PayPal, check, or in the form of stock. So please go now to our donation form at CatholicCulture.org slash donate slash audio. We pray for our benefactors every day. I thank you for listening.
De quorum solemnitate gauden tangeli et collaudant filium de. Way of the Fathers is just one of the podcasts produced by CatholicCulture.org. To hear more from the Church Fathers in their own words, check out Catholic Culture audiobooks, readings of Catholic classics including the Fathers and St. John Henry Newman, and for interviews on a wide range of topics in Catholic arts and culture, listen to the Catholic Culture podcast.